Okay, so what is it that tempts you? <laughs> iPad, chocolate, what, what tempts you? Candy? Your phone? Sleep. Sleep? <laughs> homework, homework is not tempting. It's tempting not to do your homework, right? So adult, I'm hearing a lot of kids answer this. I want to hear some older kids. What tempts you? Bacon. Bacon? <laughs> you said that on purpose. <laughs> Coffee? Coffee? What? A cold beer on a warm day. Right? What? And I'm still waiting on mine. <laughs> Ice cream? All of these things tempt us, right? But what does that really have to do with this lesson? What does it mean to be tempted by something? And to actually understand what it is that happened to Jesus here. You see this story... In the story that goes with it, right? The Genesis story. And then there's that, that interesting thing, that theological discussion that Paul did with the Romans and Romans that we could have a lengthy conversation after service about if you wanted to. We have the Genesis reading and the, and the Matthew reading, right? We have Matthew where Jesus is filled by the Spirit and then sent to the desert and he fasts. For 40 days and 40 nights, and then he's tempted or tested by the devil. So for those of you that ever wondered about that line in the Lord's Prayer, right? And lead us not into temptation, right? God wouldn't possibly lead us into temptation, right? Well, right here in Matthew, it says that God himself took Jesus to the wilderness so that he could be tempted, so don't think that God doesn't test us in ways. It doesn't mean that God's not there with us during those testing times, right? The Spirit sent Jesus out into the wilderness to be tested. And three times the devil comes to him. He says, if you are the Son of God, because you're hungry, right? How many of you have ever gone 40 days and 40 nights without food? I've gone 40 hours, maybe. <laughs> I've gone at least 30 hours without food. And you're hungry, right? And the devil comes to Jesus and he says, If you are the Son of God, turn these, bread, turn these stones into bread because you're hungry so you could eat. Right? And there's that, that I've, I've preached that sermon before my daughter said it, right? And I keep saying, if. What is that word, if, also? Yeah, the devil, here's the, here's the thing that we have to understand about this passage. The devil is not questioning whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. The word a in Greek, which is the word for if, we get translated here, also means since. So the devil is, I think that the, what this way that should be translated is the devil is saying to Jesus, since you are the son of God, you have the power to turn these stones into bread. So you're hungry. Go ahead and do it. It's not about whether or not Jesus is the son of God. The devil knows who he is. The devil's telling him, you can take care of your hunger right now. Just change these stones to bread and eat them. And Jesus says... It says that we do not live by bread alone, but by the, every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil picks Jesus up and he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. The pinnacle of the temple. Why? Because in Jewish understanding, the pinnacle of the temple is the highest point in the world. It doesn't matter if there's mountains higher than that. The pinnacle of the temple is the point at which heaven and earth touch. So it is the highest point in the world. And the devil takes Jesus to this point. And what does the devil do? 
He quotes scripture. So don't think knowing scripture is good enough. Don't think just because I can quote certain passages out of this book that I'm okay. Because you know what? The devil knows this book better than you do. Period. He knows it inside and out and can use it against you better than you could possibly use it against him. So don't think just because I know what this book says that I'm okay. Because the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. He said, here you are on the pinnacle of the temple. The scripture says that if you throw yourself off, that he's going to send his angel so that you're not going to hit the ground. They're going to catch you before you touch the ground. And Jesus says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And then the devil takes him to the mountain and shows him all of the kingdoms of the world and says, all of this is yours. Well, isn't it really already all his? But the devil actually at this point has control to to a point. The devil says, if you will, but. What does the devil say? Worship me. I will give all of this to you. And Jesus says, he says, what confirmation students, the Wyatt, don't read it out of the thing. What does he say? Tell me what it is. He says, worship the Lord, your God only. What is that? The first commandment, the 10 commandments, you'll have only one God and you worship him only, right? Jesus says to the devil, worship God only. You see, all of this is is good for us to hear, but how does that work? Because none of us are Jesus. None of us could fast for 40 days and 40 nights and then stand up against the enemy of all of us in any way, shape or form like this. So how does this help us? Well, let's look back at Genesis for just a moment. Right. Genesis, we get the story of the serpent coming to who? And read it again. Look at this. We always say that the serpent came to just Eve, right? It's all about Eve screwing up. Women, here's your, here's your day to, to get your, your comebackets, right? It says that, that, that Eve was the one who did this. The serpent went to Eve, and Eve went and took the apple, and Eve bit it. And then she went and found Adam. No, it says right there that she turned around and gave some to her husband, who was with her. Adam was there the whole time, and he didn't even open his mouth. <laughs> So, women, the next time the men say to you that it's all Eve's fault, look at them and go, well, if you would have been there, maybe you should have opened your mouth and said something to that serpent. So this wouldn't have happened. Right? What did the serpent do, though? That's the thing. What did the serpent do? What did the devil do? What? He tempted her. But how? Because look at it. This apple really isn't anything bad. Right? If it was an apple, it was a fruit. I can't say it was an apple because Genesis doesn't, doesn't say what it is, right? It was probably an avocado because it's good fat. Avocados are good for you, so, right? But whatever this fruit was, it was good and it was, it was pleasant to look at and it was good to eat. It's not a bad thing. And all of the stuff that the devil actually tempts Jesus with is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Eating bread is not a bad thing. Unless you eat too much of it, and then you get like this. I mean, the the serpent came to them and said, did God really say not to eat any tree? He twisted the words. He made them think about what it was that God had said to them. It made them think about who they are. See, here's the thing that we really have to understand about this passage that really does give us all hope. Not the Genesis passage, but the Matthew passage. See, the devil in Genesis comes to Eve and makes her think about what God had said and twists God's words to make her think about who she is and who God wants her to be. And the thing about the Matthew text is what happens right before it. 
Who can tell me what happens in Matthew chapter 3? Right? We want to think that we're doing this sequentially, right? So the last thing that would have happened would have been we were up on the mountaintop and Jesus was there with Peter, James, and John. And Peter said, let's build three tents. But you have to remember that that's Matthew chapter 17. That hadn't happened yet. What happened right before this? What happened right before this? Right before Jesus is driven out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, he comes up out of the water, standing in the Jordan River with John the Baptist, and God opens up the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was just baptized. And he was named and claimed by God as God's own. And when Jesus gets thrown out into the wilderness, the Spirit is there to send Him out to prepare Him for what is about to happen. And when the devil comes to Him, Jesus remembers clearly who He is. And more importantly, whose He is. And He says to the devil when He's hungry and He's ready to eat that bread, He says, I'm not going to do it because God says that we should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of His mouth. And then when the devil says, test him because he's going to catch you, Jesus says, don't do that because I know who he is and I don't have to worry about that. He's always been with me and he'll always be with me. And when the devil takes him to the mountain and says, all of this can be yours if you worship me, he says not to do that because God says to worship him alone. And all of this is already mine because I am the son of the living God and he is my father. And each and every one of us can say that. Because when we're out there and we're being tempted, when we're out there in that thing, whatever it is, oh, it smells really good. (laughs) Whatever that thing is that's out there in front of us that we're ready to reach out and grab, it makes us think that that is so much more important than what we already have. It makes us forget who we are. It makes us forget whose we are. We just have to remember the Jordan. We have to remember the water. We have to remember that we were washed clean of everything that's ever happened to us and anything that ever will happen to us. And that in those waters, God opened up the heavens and claimed us as his beloved son, as his beloved daughter, and calls us to go out into the world to share that love with everyone. No matter what the devil throws at you, all you have to do is remember the waters of your baptism. And cling tightly to our God. Because at the end of the first stanza of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Right? We'll sing it on Reformation. We should have sang it this morning. That would have been a fun one for you, Bernie. The last line, the very last line of the first verse is, One little word subdues him. The whole first verse is about how the devil has power and dominion over this world right now. But Martin Luther wrote that one little word subdues him. And what is that one little word? What? It's baptizo. It's the Greek word for baptizo, which means I have been baptized. It's not... It's not God, it's not Jesus, it's not, it's baptizo. Because I have been claimed in those waters, so you have no power over me. Whatever temptation you bring my way means nothing against what God has already done and will continue to do for me. So remember that. As we journey towards the cross with Jesus, As we journey through a time where it seems like we're being tempted and tested in every place that we go, cling tightly to those waters of baptism. Cling tightly to your heavenly Father because He's named you and claimed you. And He's taking care of everything. And He always walks with you on every step of the journey.